welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Um, your story is one that is gripping, painful, and hopeful all at the same time. You are a physician who's based in London. You've mm -hmm. been involved in global healthcare for, I think it's about 14 years mm -hmm. now. And you actually spent part of your childhood growing up in Syria. Yeah. When you look at the, the civil war that's taking place there now, from a health care point of view, from an aid giver's point of view, mm -hmm. what is the situation? Sure. So before that, if I may, I think one of the things that has done the Syria um, crisis such a uh, disfavor is calling it a civil war. Because actually, this isn't half the population killing the other half. Right. What we have is a state-sponsored murder and oppression that was in response to people going out on the street calling for freedom and dignity. And so it's actually a war on civilians. Right. And it's a war on civilian structures, and it's had at its heart the targeting of doctors and aid workers and healthcare. And you guys know all about presidents trying to destroy healthcare, right? <laughs> I mean, it's... Yeah. You, it's a you, big problem. Yeah, I mean, for, for Syrians, they would wish it would be just in the Senate and people arguing about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know, it, in, in Syria, you've had a situation where Bashir al-Assad has been shown repeatedly to indiscriminately attack uh, medical facilities. Yeah. What does that do, and what do you think the purpose of those attacks have been? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Physicians for Human Rights have been documenting this since the beginning of, of, of the war in 2011. They've documented nearly 500 attacks on, on health um, healthcare facilities. Some of them are indiscriminate, but actually they say that this has been part of a systemic um, attack on healthcare and, and murder and torture of, of, of healthcare workers. So actually using it as a weapon of war. And it's decimated our healthcare system. Right. And that basically means that we've got children who are dying from preventable diseases like pneumonia or treatable diseases. It's women who are now giving birth without healthcare um, attendance. It means we don't have the anesthesia that we need to, to perform surgery. And you know what? This is like such a big problem for all of us, right? This isn't just a problem for Syria. And by that I mean that Targeting of healthcare workers, like, like this is protected by international norms, right? Uh -huh. and, and when we allow that to occur, then actually when it breaks for one, it breaks for all. Does that mean that, that your healthcare facilities will now be a legitimate target in any war that you may be involved in? Right. Like it's a really dangerous precedent to set, right? Um, and the fact that it's destroying our healthcare um, means that we're going to become like Liberia and Sierra Leone. We're going to become exporters of disease and... And, and viruses don't know borders, right? It, it ends up being a problem that affects the world when it could have been stopped in one place. Absolutely. When you returned in 2011, mm. you, you went back to Syria, and this was when uh, the crisis was kicking off. Yeah. And you, you helped, you know, you turned a house into an aid depot, and you, mm. you were going to help with uh, people donating blood, and, 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 and you realized that that wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't it enough, and what did you then decide to do? Right, so I think... In every crisis, the first responders are the people who are affected, right? It's the affected community. And so mm -hmm. my family, like many others, turned our houses into warehouses that we could distribute this aid from. But then as the crisis grew and it engulfed the whole country, it sure became apparent like these little efforts were, were no, no longer sufficient. So we coalesced and we started to form new charities. Um, and actually it's the local humanitarians, it's the local doctors, nurses and aid workers that do the majority of the aid work in Syria. Right. Um, so um, a group called Local to Global said that 75% of the humanitarian work in Syria is being done by Syrian charities. Right, seventy-five percent. Like people don't know that, right? You think it's I mean the that's United amazing, Nations but you wish the that the charities. outside would help as well. But I mean that that is an amazing stat when you think about it. Well, it's amazing, but what's really more amazing, but in a very bad way, is the fact that we get less than one percent of the humanitarian aid budget. Right? It's, yeah, I know. Look at your face. Wow. I know. <laughs> I know. You would think for a crisis that affects the world, uh, more would be done. More people would be getting involved. Um, you're working to help now. You've started um, working to rebuild mm -hmm. some of the hospitals that have been destroyed. I remember reading and seeing one of the stories was a children's hospital yes. that was attacked. You were involved in uh, rebuilding that. How did you go about that? Where do you even start? Um, you start with a weekend of nearly pulling your hair out and feeling really frustrated and angry that this is still happening because that weekend in eastern Aleppo, five hospitals were bombed out of existence that weekend, wow. including the children's hospital. Imagine it had been bombed six times before, a children's hospital. So this and, was the seventh time it was bombed? Yeah. 
And so I was, I was so livid and furious. We'd been spending the last few years rebuilding and built six, helped to build six hospitals in Syria. And so I wanted to do something that everyone else could get behind because I knew that there were so many people who were feeling this frustration. Yeah. And that was how the People's Convoy idea came. Um, we planned um, to crowdfund to rebuild an entire children's hospital. And we wanted to do it in the week before Christmas in 10 days and we wanted to take the whole equipment for the hospital across from London across Europe to Syria and we did that. Um, 5,000 people from around wow. the world. Wow. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't just me, you know, this was like literally a global collective effort. It was um, 30 organizations that came, back, came together to endorse the campaign and it was 5,000 people from 10 countries mm -hmm. raised $320,000 in 12 days. Um, enough to rebuild the hospital and keep it going for six months. Um, it's just, it just goes to show how much we can achieve when we, when we, when we work together and when we can channel this, these emotions that we have in a positive, proactive if, way. If people are looking to do that, I know people feel hamstrung. They go, we've talked to our politicians. It doesn't seem like there is going to be much in the way of mm -hmm. action, you know, whether it be the US and Russia agreeing into a ceasefire or not a ceasefire. What is the thing that people can do to help on the ground if they are not connected to Syria directly like you are? Sure. I mean, you know, like at Can Do, we believe people are the biggest superpower. Um, and we just need to have a way in which we can harness that collective energy mm -hmm. and, and resources. And that's why we're using crowdfunding. And we've just set up a crowdfunding platform, the first one to, to, to provide humanitarian aid in war zones. Um, and we're calling all of you, the engaged citizens of the world, the global humanitarians. And through this platform, we're going to connect you to local humanitarian organizations working in war zones um, so that you guys can know exactly where your money is going and you can trust that it's going to these trusted, impactful local humanitarian organizations um, so that we can together provide this health care and save many more lives. Um, and I think that's the way to do it because um, our, the, the big NGOs are so bureaucratic and right. so slow to move, and they make us feel really detached from the issues, right? And it feels really disengaging and disempowering to just hand your money over and you've no idea where it goes. And this is where you goes. can directly connect. Absolutely, and you can, you, well, this way you can connect, but you can also n choose which project you want to support. So, you know, the beauty of local humanitarians is they know the communities really, right. really well, and they know what's needed and how to get it there. And they're creative because they're the ones who are there in the most need. So to give you an example, there's a ceasefire um, across much of Syria, but there are still, and people don't know, there's about a million people who are besieged. Literally, like a medieval siege tactic, being slowly starved to death. And so besieged Damascus is one of these areas where there's about 400,000 people being slowly starved to death. So one of our local partners has been working over the last couple of years to um, grow mushrooms, which we call the meat of the poor. And so they've been working to see if they can, they can get them to germinate and grow. Wow. And they've managed to do that. So one of the campaigns we're currently running, um, um, for imagine just less than $15,000 is going to feed 800 people in a sustainable way. Right. It's going to teach them how to grow their own mushrooms so that they can feed themselves when there is no other fresh food source there. So they really have got that ability to provide something really effective and really efficient. Um, and um, I think that's the way that we can all make a difference to people in crisis. Oh, thank you for sharing that. With you. Thank you so much for thank being you. on the show. Thank you. For more information about Dr. Halem's work in Syria, go to candoaction.org. Dr. Rula Halem, everybody.